I would pick the moon. Pick all the skies. <laughs> Yeah. I just turn that on off. Beam stop. The yeah, the live stream should be on. Do you know where you find it? So you just go it's on. Yeah. All right. So, hello everyone, and for those of you joining on YouTube, my name is Amanda Pfeiffer. I'm an education coordinator with the CLS Education Committee. Welcome to our uh, first in-person students on the Beamline seminar since COVID. We are pretty excited. I can feel the students' energy just radiating. Um, so, I won't take up too much of your time. These students are from Meadow Ridge School that is in Maple Ridge, BC. They had the opportunity to use the CMCF PM uh, Beamline this past week to investigate radiation exposure on protein stability. So with that, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Meadow Ridge Seminar. Today, we'll be talking about the topic, radiation exposure on protein stability. Before we get into the seminar, we will start with a quick introduction. Hi, my name is Peter. My last name is Sin. And hi, this is Jerome Wong. Hello, oh, my name is Stephen Wei. Hello, oh, I'm Jason Lee. My name is Isabel Kong. My name is Phoebe Xu. My name is Hugo. My name is Yuan Wong. My name is Grace Yu. My name is Ryan Oliva. We also have an important member joining us remotely online. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ikuri Yoshiyama, and I'm joining in from Ireland right now. Great. Okay. Yeah, so now that we have our, all of our introductions over, let's uh, just jump into the presentation. So, um, there you go. <laughs> Internet connection is a bit laggy. Sorry about that. So yeah, we're from uh, Maple Ridge, British Columbia, uh, which is just about an hour's drive outside of Vancouver. Um, our school, Meadow Ridge School, is a K to twelve school, uh, and we have the IB continuum, which means we have everything from uh, we have the IB program in place from kindergarten all the way to grade twelve, ending with the uh, diploma program, which is the program that all of us are uh, uh, pretty much finishing uh, this year. Um, the school was founded in 1985, and uh, our mission is to learn to live well with others and for others in a just community. Before we go on to the meat of this presentation, we should first uh, start off with a land acknowledgement. Uh, so Meadow Ridge School is located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Keitsi, the Kwantlen, and Stolo First Nations. The CLS in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan is located on Treaty 6 land in the traditional territories of the, the uh, Nahiwa, uh, Anishinaabe, Lakota, Dakota, and Lakota nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis. So I'll begin by talking about our journey and how we got here. So in March 2021, we started with a Beamlines project with uh, Beamline for, the Beamlines for School competition at the European Organization for Nuclear Research. So that was another competition that the team participated in. There, we investigated using positrons instead of electrons to uh, in cancer therapy. So we would shoot the positrons at the cancerous cells to uh, try to minimize the radiation damage on the neighboring healthy cells. Uh, in August 2021, we began this uh, Students on the Beamline project. And so we learned about the CLS as well as SOT in general. Over the next few months, we investigated several different topics, including inhibiting zinc dendrites in batteries, as well as um, seeing uh, the prevalence of Fibonacci sequence and investigating why it is and where, why, uh, what it is and why it occurs. Finally, in March 2022, we finalized with the general topic of proteins, then deciding to de uh, dive deeper into insulin specifically because of its accessibility and also because of the presence of zinc. So um, 
Then we uh, filled out the paperwork, including the CL uh, CLS permit and the safety training. And now we are here to give our presentation in August. So this is our research question. And there are a lot of key terms that we will be going over in the next few slides. But um, just to give you an idea, our research question is, how does the X-ray exposure time of insulin impact its structural stability at cryogenic and room temperatures during crystallography experiments? So essentially, uh, to clarify what it means, it's basically saying that X-ray beams, when shined at um, the proteins, would create uh, a radiation damage on the proteins. And so we're trying to investigate if by changing the temperature or by changing how long the protein is exposed to the x-ray um, and wh whether or not that will affect the damage. So why do we care about this topic? We see that a lot of pharmaceutical companies rely on x-ray crystallography to investigate the shape and the structure of the uh, protein. And this is important for drug development, for example, because um, the way proteins bond to other uh, enzymes or other like um, just molecules in the body is heavily dependent on its structure. Therefore, they would rely on X-ray crystallography to figure out that structure. Now, we know that at, um, X-ray crystallography creates damage, right? So generally they try to perform it at cryogenic temperatures, which is at 120 Kelvin or at um, minus 150 degrees Celsius or lower. So at those cool temperatures, uh, we it is believed that um, the X-ray crystallography would not cause any damage on the protein. So our question is, is that true? Because if the assumption is false, it means that our drug Drugs currently are not being manufactured in the most effective way possible. So that is why we're investigating this question. Yeah, let's go through the basics here, starting with proteins. They're found everywhere, such as hemoglobin, immunoglobin, and rhodopsin in our eyes. But what are they? And actually, what are they used for? Well, they have multiple functions like transport, uh, hormones, structural, or even sensation or movement, and of course, can act as enzymes. And by definition, they're macromolecules composed of um, long chains of amino acids called polypeptides. But what does that mean? Well, macromolecules are essentially molecules made of much more atoms. Therefore, they're bigger and macro. And amino acids are the molecules that form the polypeptide chains. We'll go over this in the subsequent slide. And each uh, protein has four structures. The protein structures that make up the overall structure, like a building, there's a foundation and different layers that the concrete uh, supports. And the, uh, what we're looking at today is insulin, which is a hormone made of protein produced in the pancreas that regulates blood glucose levels. And it's released into the blood when the glucose levels goes up, especially like after eating, and it helps uh, glucose enter the body cells, and therefore it can be stored or used for energy or stored for future use. Now, amino acids, they all share a common basic structure. These are the molecules that make up the proteins at the basic level. That diagram right there is the basic structure. The R group is the variable group, group, which is different across all the different amino acids. So there are about 20 total that we know of um, and are naturally found across all organisms. And the variable group changes and has different chemical properties that make each protein unique. So it can be nonpolar, um, charged, and this changes how the protein folds and interacts to form unique shapes and therefore unique roles. They're joined together by peptide bonds. And that comes into play in the primary structure of the protein. This is the amino acid sequence. And each sequence is unique because there are 20 amino acids and different lengths of sequences. There can be a huge number of different possibilities. And when forming the polypeptide chain, the order changes how the, um, the amino acid sequence interacts and folds, therefore changing the other layers. In the secondary structure, the primary structure interacts by forming hydrogen bonds with each other in different three-dimensional ways to form two shapes, alpha helices and beta beta sheets. Alpha helices occur when the uh, amino acid sequence folds into a sort of spiral shape or arrangement, and the beta plated sheet occurs when the amino acid sequence um, adopts a more directly, directionally oriented structure and it's staggered strands. So it's beta plated. It's in the diagram there. As we see, we have the third one, who's um, the tertiary structure of the protein. So it's overall folding structures that are made by one poly uh, one polypeptide chains with the secondary structure of the protein to make three-dimensional shape. 
And one of the example of the tertiary structure will be the myoglobin cell located in your muscle cells. And talking about the last one, the quaternary structure of the protein is actually made by subunits that will to form a larger protein complex. It's actually made by two or more of the polypeptide chains to the larger molecules. And on the left is the hemoglobin. It's one of the example of quaternary structures that's found in your gut. And talking about the protein denaturation, that's part of what we do in the experiment, is the molecule structure um, of the protein is going through radiations and that causes a change into the structure and loss of the function of the protein or the malfunction of the proteins that leads to um, uh, maybe it's cancers. And it's the overcoming the weight into molecular force, such as the example is the eggs. You can do and you egg from the role to a and so we already talked about the radiation could cause denaturation, where I say um, I'm doing the ionization radiation, which is a form of energy that can actually remove the electrons from the molecules and the atoms, that which can destabilize the proteins. On, on the spectrum, it's actually the ionization energy and the ionization energy. And in our life, we're exposing the radio, microwaves, and infrared that have longer wavelengths, but lower energy. And on the right is the gamma rays, X-ray, and ultraviolet, which has higher energy and shorter wavelengths. So with all the previous uh, information, now we can go over the research question again, which is uh, how does the X-ray exposure of insulin impact its structural stability at both cryogenic and room temperature during the crystallography experiment. And the hypothesis is that as the X-ray exposure time and temperature increases, the stability of the insulin decreases because of the ionizing radiation. It overcomes the intermolecular forces. And uh, with, our hypothesis, with, with our hypothesis, we need a, a tool to test uh, our experiment. So the synchrotron uh, is a, is a good way to run our experiment. Um, it's it's a it's a circular loop where uh, electrons are accelerated close to the seal of light to produce an intense uh, an intense burst of light. Uh, so how it works is that the electrons are are fired from the electron gun uh, at the top left corner and accelerated through the linear accelerator into the booster ring where uh, it gains more and more energy as it cycles through there. Uh, and then it enters into the larger ring, which is the storage ring. And there, the magnets bend the path of the electrons, uh, releasing uh, energy in the form of light into the individual beam lines. So we chose the CMCFB and beam line, which stands for the Canadian Macromolecular Crystallography Facility Bending Magnet Beam Line. And it is a single crystal X-ray diffraction beam line, and it's perfect for our experiment, which is studying uh, protein protein stability using X-ray diffraction. Mm -hmm. And then in this beam line, the crystallized samples are placed onto the sample pins, and the you can see the beam there, which is around a hundred micrometers in diameter. Okay, so protein crystallization is a key part in this experiment. And crystallization is the process in which atoms or molecules are organized into 3D lattice structures. And um, we, need, we need to crystallize our proteins because if they're not crystallized, they like to move around and fold. And that wouldn't be good if we were trying to study this, the protein specific structure. So we, we crystallize these proteins and uh, in order to allow for the x-rays to hit the protein crystal and create a pattern which we can study. So we'll be using the method called x-ray crystallography. And this is basically um, using the protein crystal that we have and then shooting a beam of x-rays at it. And this, um, the x-rays will then diffract off the crystals because of the different uh, electron densities in the crystals, and then it will create a pattern like this, uh, which is basically like a circle with some black dots. And um, this pattern is unique to the pro protein and requires um, 
some required software to compute it into a uh, structure, which we'll see later on. So creating the crystals, um, crystallization is uh, we crystallize these you, the, our crystals using a hanging drop method in which we place a protein in a water droplet on the lid of a container, and that's then flipped over and the crystals grow on the lid. And once we have the crystals grown, uh, they'll be fished out or kind of poked using a uh, small loop-like uh, tool. And this is just wide enough for one crystal to fit in because we're studying one crystal. And then after that, they'll just be placed in a sample puck with uh, 16 holes and we can just test them on the V-line and the robot can uh, use them. And I'd, we'd like to thank Dr. Niedeber for making the crystals and growing them and fishing them for us. Otherwise, it would, this experiment wouldn't be possible. So since we're looking into cryogenic temperature and room temperature, um, one of our samples have to operate in extreme cold, um, very cold temperature. So um, in that case, then uh, we have to put the cryo pot in a container that's filled with um, liquid nitrogen, um, which has a temperature of 77 Kelvin or negative 195.8 degrees Celsius. Um, and then it will be transferred into the beam line into the tank as you can see uh, on the picture on the right, um, which is also filled with liquid nitrogen. Um, for our samples um, that will be operating in room temperature, at room temperature, um, none of the liquid nitrogen will be required. Um, as you can see on the picture on the right, the robot um, can also access the crystals um, by poking into the samples and placing it into the experimental space. So looking at the sample distribution, we have a total of six bovine insulin crystals, and then we are se we separate it into two categories: three in room at room temperature and three at cryogenic temperatures. And each of the um, crystal in each category will be exposed to um, X-ray at 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and one second, respectively. Um, in terms of screening, um, normally we would um, use the 100 microns um, X-ray beam. Um, this is when we can see the crystal clearly under the microscope. Um, however, sometimes we cannot see it, um, um, see the crystal clearly under a microscope, which is why we need to use the 200 micron beam to ensure that um, the crystal is actually present in the, in the sample beam, uh, sample pin. Um, this method will not damage the crystal because um, because the um, X-ray the exposure time is very very little, um, so it will not damage the crystal structure. And in terms of the 100 micron beam, um, it is very very small. Um, it is roughly um, almost the size of the uh, human hair, which is 50 to 70 microns in diameter, and and um, when we are actually shooting the uh, crystals with the beam, um, we are rotating it um, over 360 degrees in increments of 0 0.5 um, degrees to ensure that the entire crystal is hit by the X-ray. Moving on to qualitative observation, right? Right here, we have the image of a crystal inside of that beam line. And then at the center, if you can see, there's a right circle. That's the 100 micron radiation or x-ray that will be shoot through. With this, we will get an image of electron density graph, which we saw previously. And with the electron density graph, we can actually analyze back to Dr. Ananabur. We received these models. We uh, he managed to use CUT and a bunch of magical, wonderful software to analyze the data for us to this stage with a lot of more interpretation for us. For example, we can see the different type of bounds. And as you can see, clearly see on the left picture, there is a helix and different structure, the secondary structure, which we can observe and analyze. So bond length is one of the metrics that we decided to use to measure protein damages because as the protein denatures or 
become damaged by radiation, the intermolecular forces are no longer holding each of the branches together. So the bond length are free to extend or perhaps contract. And we decided to measure it by measuring the distance back at the center of the two nucleus. And despite what the image shows, the nuclei, uh, the two atoms are not necessarily having to be completely touching or overlapping each other. It's just the electrons there. So we took different types of bonds. Then we, uh, we, we took different types of bonds and we compared the bond length within each type of them. We took the average and we compared it across the four increments where we were able to solve the protein structures for. And Unfortunately, we found no significant differences between their average bond lengths. That is an evidence of that the, uh, the proteins are not damaged enough to an extent where they started denaturized. Uh, moving on to the average bond angle. Again, it's a metric of me uh, measuring how damaged the proteins are because without the intermolecular forces, the proteins are, uh, the, sorry, the atoms are free to move around at different angles. And yeah, we measure it as two different bonds and we measure the angle between uh, them. And we compared all different combinations of them. We took the average and in the end, uh, we also found no significant changes between the average bond angles that just further supports that there are no significant protein structural damages there. And resolution is something that is, is resolution describes how uh, the quality of the images that you will see after the programs process through the crystallization data. So we can perceive proteins as stacked planes. And you can think about the resolution of crystallography as if it's the resolution of a picture of pixel. So the smallest distance between the two planes that you can manage to solve in computer software is the resolution. And we measure resolution for a crystallography beam line in Angstrom. And for reference, considering the previous analogy that Jerome bring, uh, brought up, an angstrom is, uh, uh, sorry, a, a human hair is 50 to 70 microns, and an angstrom, uh, and, and measuring angstrom, it's about 500,000 to 700,000 angstroms. So that's a really small unit. And smaller the angstrom, the better the resolution. And we can see that at cryogenic temperature, because we didn't have enough increments, we cannot this, uh, we cannot see a clear trend. However, it's uh, there's evidence to suggest that somewhere between quarter of a second of exposure time and one second exposure time, there is a sweet, sweet spot there where the resolution will be the highest. And for room temperature, unfortunately, we didn't manage to solve the uh, protein structures for half a second and one second exposure time, so it's not on the graph. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So going back to the radiation uh, again, so it is a uh, radiation damage. It is one of the uh, major indicators of how uh, the, the effect of radiation on, the, on our protein. So just as it sounds, uh, uh, radiation damage refers to any type of uh, destructions are caused by the exposure to radiation. And uh, so for protein, it is um, it disrupts the formation of the lattice, which um, prevents uh, as uh, the prevents the crystal to uh, uh, to diffract. So um, that's basically uh, will affect the, the exposure of radiation will affect the function of the protein. What we used was a metric called relative radiation damage, and we found that using Friedel pairs. If you picture this as the protein, proteins should have symmetrical sides across them called Friedel pairs. And when exposed to x-rays, they should be the exact same. Unless, of course, they're damaged by the x-ray radiation. The difference between the Friedel pairs is then measured as relative radiation damage. What we found was that samples at room temperature at 0.5 seconds and one second exposure time had too high a difference between the Friedel pairs. And so the solution was uh, the solution for those um, diffraction patterns weren't able to be produced. Although Dr. Niederberg was able to trick the software into thinking that they were still the same pair, giving us this graph of six proteins uh, and their relative radiation damage versus their exposure time. We find that uh, the room temperature graph had much higher relative radiation damage compared to the cryogenic temperature graph. So from a business perspective, invest in liquid nitrogen. 
But from a scientific perspective, we find that there is still an increase in relative radiation damage at cryogenic temperatures, which is important because we're assuming that cryogenic temperatures prevents any radiation damage from occurring. And so we're assuming that the thousands of uh, data files and protein structures that are being deposited in the protein data bank are completely accurate because they use cryogenics in their X-ray crystallography. But we still find a difference. And we will be describing that difference later on in future research. Yeah, so another indicator we use uh, to determine whether the protein is damaged or not uh, it's called the uh, RMSD, known as the uh, root mean uh, score deviation. So it is basically just a calculation of how the uh, a protein, the structure of the molecules are, uh, are are displaced or how they are deviated from the um, the reference of uh, protein. So if I give an example, I would borrow a Chibun for a second. All right, so. This is hard. So, can you raise your hand a bit? Okay, so this is his hands. So, let's say this is a reference uh, protein we have. And here we have our tested uh, or uh, targeted uh, protein. And you see that from here, I um, shifted our display. So, uh, we know that uh, we all have five fingers so that we can just line them up to find all the uh, way we. we add up all, all the difference in their distance and average them up. So to find the average uh, displacement or the average deviation uh, from the uh, reference uh, protein. So um, unfortunately, like we didn't see a significant uh, change in uh, our MSD through our data, uh, but, we're, but we're kind of surprised because like we expected that we're going to see the MSD uh, to increase as the exposure time increase as well. So uh, next is a B factor, which uh, is also known as uh, uh, D by Waller factor, temperature factor, or the atomic displacement uh, uh, parameter. So this is another indicator of uh, whether our protein was uh, kind of got, the structure of our protein is affected uh, after it got exposed to radiation. Uh, the reason is that after the uh, radiation hits the protein, uh, part of like the molecules inside are uh, they uh, they will have a thermal uh, vibration, which will cause uh, which is like you can see um in the diagram here the red part where is the the B factor is uh is the highest. So uh the location or the plate spin of those uh, molecules are not fixed, so are they more free to move around, and um. So we're trying to find, uh, yeah, that's basically one of the indicators. And we wanted to see if exposure time impacted the B factor at all. It didn't. So what we wanted to know was why the B factor didn't affect uh, or wasn't affected by an increase in exposure time. And so given that it didn't vary across the exposure times like we thought it would, we decided to see if the zinc atom in, the, uh, in insulin might affect the B factor at all. Distances between amino acids and the zinc ion were manually measured using software. Um, and so that involved a lot of clicking on a laptop. But by the end of it, we, uh, we got all of these amino, all of these dots on the graph represent an amino acid and the X axis represents the radial distance from zinc. The B factor is plotted on the Y axis. But the most significant part of this graph is the histidine and the zinc. We're assuming that zinc lies at point zero, or that's what I told the computer anyways. And histidine lies at about um, five to six angstroms. We find that histidine has one of the lowest B factors. In addition to the fact that zinc has a B factor of zero, meaning that it doesn't move throughout the entire, uh, throughout the entire data collection process. Given that histidine is close to having a B value of zero, we find that both zinc and histidine uh, serve as some sort of stability point of stability in the protein. We also think it would be interesting to further investigate this graph and see whether the radial distance from zinc overall might have uh, an effect on the B factor or whether other ions, uh, metallic ions, could affect stability in proteins. Um, and we see the traces of a potential trend here, but we don't have enough data to satisfy a conjecture regarding that. Um, and so we map the B factors, and after that, we have a summary of results. 
So we found no significant change in RMSD, B factor, bond length, and bond angle, which is not so great for us, but great for anyone using the B line because it shows that uh, the, the exposure time doesn't necessarily affect those to a very high degree to the point of concern. Cryo temperatures significantly reduce radiation damage. Exposures beyond 0.25 seconds in room temperature nearly destroy crystals, but we don't know where between 0.25 and 0.5 seconds uh, it would start to destroy the crystal. So we'd require more increments of data for that. Radiation damage increased with exposure in both cryogenic and room temperatures. And zinc maintained a B factor of zero. And so that makes us wonder whether it could act uh, as a stabilizing agent in the protein. The resolution did not increase at the one second increment, but radi radiation damage did. And so this also allows us to question whether this could be further studied um, as to finding the sweet spot between exposure and resolution. And the B factor might have increased the further away from uh, the amino acid was from zinc. And we also think that this should be a further point of study. Impact on society. Like Isabel was talking about, drug development relies on the accuracy and precision of uh, protein data bank files um, collected using uh, X-ray uh, crystallography. And so measuring the effect of X-ray radiation on symmetry and accuracy of proteins by the mere fact that we're measuring it using um, the CMCF or any crystall crystallography beamline uh, is important in evaluating how accurate and how efficient we can make drug development in terms of uh, with respect to the accuracy of our protein files. We can also look at disease-specific research and the role of metal ions in binding to proteins and diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, and a lot of protein misfolding diseases. And increased research in this area in general might be able to help evaluate or improve the accuracy of data in the protein data bank file. Don't get me wrong, it's pretty accurate given the number of developments that have sprung from the mere fact that the PDB exists. But investigating whether there is some sort of um, damage going on or some sort of error in the way we measure or use those, those files uh, would be interesting for future research. Speak, after speaking of all those successes, we do some caveats with our experiment. So in total, we had 14 crystal exposed to the CMC uh, beam, a BM beam line, but we only have six structure that has been solved for due to the restriction of time and other factors. We only we have limited sets of data, which might uh, like challenge our reliability of our results because we only have six data points to work from. And secondly, I see the crystal on diffraction patterns caused by the decentered liquid nitrogen stream. This is also could be tricky, especially when it comes to determining determining the data points. For example, you can see the ice ring interfering the electron density graph, which was tricky for Dr. Neuenberg to process. And lastly, uh, same sort of similar effect is the diffract pattern due to itself. And then what could we do as further investigation? As Rian Grace mentioned, there is from the data we received from six data points, it does indicate a sweet spot between the most optimal exposure time or the higher resolution, which we see we can do two things. First, evaluate and uh, evaluate the graph or have more data points to see uh, to see the linear or like whatever function regression to testify or to predict the sweet spot. Or secondly, we could simply just test what where is the sweet spot with as many proteins we can. And computational modeling is similar to a testing for a sweet spot, but it's testing for the sweet spot of, it's not testing for the sweet spot. It's similar in the sense where we need to find a function or find a simulation or try to create the simulation that simulates what x-ray is, what crystal is exposed to x-ray and have sort of a, like a modeling or simulation that you could run as a program so that you don't need to have to run every single, uh, run the data every single time, 
causing like human errors and etc., which is limited, but it's also theoretical. Lastly, the role of metal ions. As Freya mentioned, there could be more, way more research in the regards of um, medicinal research and disease research regarding to the role of metal ions, since we see from the zinc, it was one of the most stabilized with a B factor of almost, it, it was zero. It was zero. Yes. And our experience, we arrived on August 8th, of 2022, it's been a long way. It's also been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's new, but we had, it was for most of us, it was the first dorm experience, college life experience at CLS. And we had these all amazing mentors that guided us on the second day. And we had a competition of whose hand doesn't shake on the second day afternoon where we were fishing the crystals because it was what I had in my heart to find. And Wednesday, we had, surprisingly, it was a work day and one of the most relaxing evening because we, we didn't have the data at the time. And obviously, yesterday was a busy day of data processing. And thanks for all the help from Dr. Nineberg, we even received data today's morning. And now we're here doing the presentation. And lastly, uh, we thank our, we acknowledge our, uh, these corporations, Canadian Light Source, thank you for everything that we are providing, and Better School, where we came from, and NSERC, which sponsored us or generously provided our travel fees, which was great. And last acknowledgement about Amazing mentor at Canadian Light Source guided our hand, guided, uh, guided our way for everything. And thank you, our teachers, Ms. Mohor, and all the staff that worked with us. And last but not least, thank you for listening. And now we are open for questions. Made the audience more nervous. <laughs> Any questions? What did you find the most challenging for you guys with your? Uh, I think uh the challenging part is definitely uh analyzing the data, especially uh those data are in different files, like different type of files, and to really read them, even like uh, trying to analyze them, uh, we have to like search online to find different programs, different codes, and change their different lines and um, change a few uh, parameters to even uh, analyze the data. So I think a big part of time was going to that part to even start to analyze the data. Yeah. Yeah, I think also like figuring out what was important to look at. Coop had probably a thousand different buttons we could click on there, um, but we had to find the right ones and think about what would be significant. Please. Uh, uh, can you congratulate you on that? I think that this was a good uh, presentation for a student even to find out what cryptography can do for you. Uh, because you have know, to but I have a few pointed out a few things. Uh, zinc uh, wouldn't have a zero uh, vibration at some passing. Uh, so something is wrong with the scaling. Zero vibration, so that one doesn't exist. So that's uh, from from theory point of view, that's not one thing. Then uh, the crystal. Another example, crystallography is not damaging crystal. X-ray is not damaging crystal. Because you have the, the second slide that crystallography is damaging crystal. X-ray is doing uh, that are damage, not crystallography. Crystallography is a sign, right? X-ray is a phenomenon. I can I can go like show me like you know, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, that's that's great. I mean, like I said, that's uh, kind of the view of what crystallography can do for you. And uh, Thank you. Oh, and for context, this is Pavel. He used to be the beam line scientist for CMCF and is now our life sciences. I have a question. I don't know if you explained it, but why did you use bovine as your 
I think it was mostly for accessibility. Um, it had a zinc ion, so we were interested in looking at um, metals and proteins as well. Um, and I think Dr. Remember was working on insulin for a bit to, uh, in terms of how to crystallize it before we got here. So uh, we thought it was perfect. Um, when you were preparing for this, did you come across any other research into being damaged on crystals? If so, how did that compare to your findings? I think they're looking at a uh, serial crystallography as sort of like a, a mitigation for that. Um, there was this paper that was investigating the possibility of beam damage. And so they proposed a fix to that by um, screening uh, many different proteins at the same time and like, compiling those files to produce the image instead of rotating the crystal. Uh, and so we found that interesting and thought we might want to try to measure it. Couple of questions. So, how you chose three exposure times? How do those relate to exposure times that are typically used on the CMC FPM? We mostly, uh, I think, what we did was we kind of wanted to find like two boundaries that wouldn't destroy it. Um, and one that would be very close to destroying it. Um, I think the normal is between 0.25 and 0.5, or 0.25 and 0.75. Um, but we wanted to get as close as possible to possibly destroying it to see whether we find any difference uh, between the exposure times. Can you pull up the graph you did? Where you've got your three room temperature, your three cold. Damage versus exposure time. But don't, no, don't, don't that. Before the, before the, yeah. yeah it is. That, right? So you could decide to fit a straight line through those, right? But you haven't got many data points. So you could do something like if you take the, the triangles and you fit them with a curve, right? just mentally do that, it's going to hit zero radiation damage before there's zero exposure. Okay. So what for me would be really interesting would be to fill in some of those and actually do much shorter exposures. What's going on there? Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But then you're going to run to, and you know, maybe the just a lot of us here comment at some point your exposure time is going to be too short to get these. Yeah. Actually, there's always nothing for that because if this was short treatment, we didn't have enough time to do that. What experiment were you to do? You need to care for lines more easily. But I mean, the most important fact is that the so you can, you can learn from it and the don't have to set up just higher. That's the thing that you remember. I mean, I would not go into detail. Uh, and also, the, the definition of how we would measure the, the freedom of ours. Uh, this is one of the methods, because other methods to look at the radiation damage, right? but therefore, it's more complicated. Um, so, I have a question. So, what is the, uh, the, uh, the radical of your damage in the case of all cases? Sorry? What is the radical? So the radical is a, is a, you know what it means, radical. So it's like a proton, photons, electrons who want to go those three. Which one is actually the most situation because lower, especially at lower temperature. Um, sure. I, yeah. I think we can look. They are electrons. So the free radical, the crystal. Electrons. But then, when, uh, when the process started as a cascade, which is complicated, uh, many other particles are being created from the components of uh, atoms that are in the, in the structure. But electrons are the most important ones that they started. So, okay, when you, when you, so another question. So, when you have a crystal exposed and put it aside and, uh, and uh, 
continue 10 days later, what would be the difference? Uh, uh, are you suggesting that we kept it in cryo temperature or in either? Let's say even cryo, but it's more profound in the room temperature. I mean, I assume it would be fold or attempt to, but if there's some significant damage, it would remain damaged during those things. So, so, so this is, uh, I'm going to ask you the first question. There's a few articles that already exist, and you're going to find them. The crystal that is exposed, okay, it would not be damaged, it would not be damaged, it would not be damaged with the x rays. So, if there's a long time, uh, in crystals that are very exposed, is asking for the travel. This, this process is actually less visible for frozen crystals, but it's also very much for a long time. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. What did you guys find most I'd say visiting the beam line itself and touring the synchrotron, it was really interesting to find out how everything worked. Yeah. We'd love the data analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Not part at all. I felt like a real scientist when processing this data. Mm. Well, yesterday it might have felt like torture, but I think we had quite a bit of fun trying to figure out how to convert the um the pdb files into all sorts of different file formats and we can automate the process of calculating the radio distance from uh zinc to other atoms but otherwise it was quite uh it was quite interesting yeah what was your reaction to seeing the image that that was actually generated from uh, the beam line so i looked at the city graph no, actually, the, the image of the crystal itself and the detail in it. Oh, so the 3D modeling. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that was Thursday morning. We walked into the door with the screen projecting a whole 3D model with a gigantic, beautiful protein that has all those different amino acid branches. That was exciting until we got to analyze them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, unfortunately, Tracy's not here, but she usually takes the last question. She says it with such enthusiasm, so I'll try and body that for you. But um, she is posting it in the chat, so just I'll read it off so you have it. So Tracy says, first, this has been a spectacular presentation. Thank you for such a good explanation of the concept for your research. Very well done with three exclamation points there, or two, sorry. <laughs> and then as you see on the screen, her question, as high school students in learning situation, as much as you are also researchers, what is the one big thing that you would take away with you? And in true Tracy fashion, she's asking each one of you to give an answer. <laughs> so, we, we Typically, you start with the right. All right, let's go. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So the biggest takeaway, I would say, is regardless how late, keep trying. Regardless how many times you try, try another way. <laughs> we been through yesterday. I think at least within six hours, we went through. Six or seven different programs trying to get the data that we are looking for. And that process, although it wasn't that fun, but I think it's worth it to do. And we should continue to put that effort in all sorts of projects. I feel like the biggest takeaway for me is that um, science is um, just unpredictable at all. Um, on the experimental day, we thought it would be a quick um, data collection um, that each crystal would just take like a few seconds to collect the data. But it ended up, um, we were the first group, like me, you, and Chuan uh, were the first group, and we were there for like an hour and a half, and we only collected one crystal, the data for one crystal, and yeah. For me, I would say personally, I'm more, I came into this more 
interested in sort of the industry-wide nature of science, but after seeing the beamline and seeing all the data processing, I think I have a new appreciation for just how advanced like the beamline science is, synchrotron science. Yeah, so I feel like the uh it's just I feel like really different than the textbook science, right? Because real world is never really about theory. The theory itself it's it's useful, but then like when until like you comes to the real world and do the science, do the experiment, you will like I personally find there's so many like more challenge or difficulties we didn't expect before. So um I feel like that's just part of science. It's nothing bad about it. It's real world and solving real world problem. Um, I think for me, I learned that science is not just about the pure science, but also about the presentation. And especially I really appreciated all the feedback that we received yesterday during our um, dry run throughs and also today. Um, yeah, it's about also just making it like visually, like quite simple to comprehend. And um, yeah, presentation is pretty different from a written report. Um, for me, I was just amazed by the way we, the process of the crystallography and how this works as we fish the crystal, just try and move it. And um, I just learned that science, yeah, as Jerome says, unpredictable, and it may not go the way you want it to go, but just don't give it up because we're keep trying and working on the process, and we got the presentation we got today. I think for me, the biggest takeaway is that, like, science is just, really about collaboration. It's really important to collaborate with your group. Like for our project, it covered a vast area of science. Like we have biology, chemistry, physics, pretty much all covered in our project. Like we have proteins, we have also x-rays. Also, yeah, also computer science. And we have like chemistry with the bond lengths and stuff. So I think it's really important that like we, like each of, each member of our group like contributed their kind of expertise and what is like what one person struggles with, like another person would could excel at. So I think that was really important for our success. I think what I learned from this uh, is no matter how much you plan that, uh, there's always gonna be unexpected things that happen, uh, like with our data collection. Uh, yeah, so always plan for the worst and then we'll be prepared. Um, I'm going to get a little bit less philosophical. <laughs> My biggest takeaway is kind of quite small. It's a 12-point full silver plated full. And on a slightly more serious note, I think uh, my biggest takeaway is how complex engineering is to make such a big facility of advanced technologies to well, work consistently and, yeah, over a long period of time. My biggest takeaway is probably that communication is almost as equally as important as the science itself. Um, I, I, the number of times I've had to restart a sentence when trying to talk to my team members uh, is kind of <laughs> kind of the main theme of the last twelve hours. Uh, but yeah, the presentation taught me a lot about communication. Akira, yeah, uh, my biggest takeaway was. That um, that programming and computer science, or at least programming, uh, in the uh, applied um, in the field, like in scientific research, is is actually quite interesting. Uh, when you when you think about, uh, or at least for me, when when I think about what jobs I might want to have in the future, you know, the the first ones that pop in my head are always are always like, okay, working at, at like in big tech or or in the financial industry as a programmer or uh working like in robotics or manufacturing or whatever um but scientific research and and all the programming that goes into it to maintain these systems is it's also really quite interesting and uh and it's also fun so it, i guess i got a bit of exposure to that and uh um, maybe uh tonight I'll, I'll look a bit more into it and you know see what, what it's really like a few of the projects that we uh that we use online also seem quite interesting and some of them are open source so so, uh, so you know, I could we, people could contribute to it uh, whenever they'd like. So that, yeah, that that'd be quite interesting to to look into. All right, and as you see in the chat, Tracy had a follow up question, but I'll let Peter if you want to read off the question so you can put your teeth on. <laughs> <laughs> and for the teachers, you have had a unique opportunity 
experience, to experience this in-depth learning yourself. In addition, watching your students go through them. What is a takeaway that you have as a teacher? I would love to answer that. So when you guys first started and you came up with the idea of crystallography, I smiled, my stomach sank, and I thought, that's okay, they'll give it up. It's too complex. The uh, learning curve is too steep. You will finally turn your back on crystallography, so I'll humor you. But you kept going. And then Dr. Dienhofer came in and he said, well, I can fill in those gaps. And I thought, okay, learning, learning curve, still very steep, don't know how we'll do this. But the tenacity, the determination, the willingness of people in this organization to answer our questions, to support us when we get stuck. Um, last night, we were confronted with that moment where I thought, that's exactly what I thought it would be. What do we do with this? And I watched you guys work together to find computer options, mathematical ways of expressing it, metaphors to speak to each other, images to bring in. And you found your way through. You stayed up till midnight. You didn't give up. And I think my takeaway is I've been humbled by your capacity to actually break through what seemed to me to be almost impossible boundaries by drawing on each other, the expertise of generous people, and to ask a lot of questions. So I have actually been inspired by working with you and um, your limitless, boundless potential that's born of a spirit of science and inquiry has been breathtaking. So thank you for the ride. And to all the people here who made this possible. All right, I, I thought we were going to need one. Anyways, so my main takeaway, I guess, first, uh, babysitting and science do go together somehow. I don't know how that works, but it's been fun. Uh, and I guess Miss Cindy Hobbs put everything so elegantly that I can't possibly exceed. So I'll share a bit of personal note. So for the scientists here, um, I am one of the people I hate, you guys hate the most on the planet. I'm a theorist. <laughs> <laughs> So by actually being here, I'm seeing how you guys are actually doing the mechanical debugging, uh, do the machinery, all the softwares. I promise I will never say to my professor again, why can't they just do this? That's my take on <laughs> it. Um, all right, I'm kind of late to the game, so I was involved in the whole long train of things here. Um, but as a chemistry teacher who's been teaching for a lot of years, a lot of what we do is based on faith in that <laughs> we're really hoping that what we're doing is in some way resembling actual science but really we haven't been outside the classroom for years so it's a lot of a guess um and it's nice it was reassuring to a degree that within the IB program that these kids are in um the same struggles they're facing here and that our reality and science are integrated in there um, we just give them different acronyms. And so it was nice to see we weren't completely off base in trying to prepare them for what's coming up if they wanted to go into this. Um, and I would also say that watching each of them in different areas as they were touring the facility and then thinking that they're going to use the facility, just a tour, you never really engage. But the fact that they were actually going to use this equipment and the way this worked, what everybody was doing, ups your engagement substantially. So each of them was sort of glued in to seeing something throughout this facility, whether it was the part storage region and how beautifully it was organized, <laughs> um, <laughs> or it was the posters of the different things they're able to accomplish, or just the sheer scale and the, the, beauty, the beauty of the um, engineering in this place. I think without them being here, having done this, 
there is no way that they would have gained even remotely close to the depth of experience they got being here. So, I, and this, like the way it's been run is, I don't, I've never seen anything like it. And I think it's an area in many other areas in science or in industry that is untapped or undertapped in terms of getting the best into what you want to get into is they are walking around suddenly seeing that this possibility exists. The pictures didn't show them that, right? The beautiful suspension of the piping is not apparent until you see it vibrating. And so I think the value of bringing kids into places like this is, uh, you know, phenomenal. And so I would say that's one of the things is this is definitely an amazing program that is under tapped. So that's my take. Oh. All right, we'll end it with there. Um, I just want to extend a thank you to Anna Maria Beckler, who's watching on YouTube. Um, she was the other education coordinator that helped facilitate this group. Thank you to those that came in, and as well as those that are watching, and we'll leave it there. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.